Uh, thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Ben Spohn, oral historian in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. During these hangouts, we'd like to introduce you to some of the fascinating research being done using the historical collections at the Hagley Library, especially by folks who have received grants from the Hagley Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society. One such researcher joining me today is Kevin Bunch. Kevin is a writer and communication specialist at the International Joint Commission and an independent researcher on the history of video games. He has a forthcoming book called Atari Archive due out in May of 2023. And Kevin was also the inaugural recipient of Hagley's Oral History Project grant. And today we'll be discussing his research supported by that grant. So, uh, Kevin, welcome back to the show. Long time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, I'm happy you'd be back. Uh, for those who haven't, and since we're focusing on a different component of your research, but for those who haven't seen uh, part one, so to speak, uh, can you give us an overview of what it is you are working on? Uh, so I've been researching the history of uh, RCA's work in computers and video games. Um which is surprisingly more robust than I realized going into it. But uh, that's been the benefit of sifting around uh, your papers and doing this oral history project. Really, how, how much more robust has it been? I mean, our uh, RCA holdings are so massive. I, I haven't been able to really wrap my head around them. Do we have, what do we have? Uh, so when I started off, I was only aware of some of the stuff in the 70s that was sort of led up by Joe Weisbecker. Uh, so we're talking about the RCA Studio 2 home game system, uh, the arcade machines uh, that they test they tested out in 1975, uh, the Cosmic VIP computer, that sort of thing. Uh, but I found that there were a few examples of games that they'd done in the 60s uh, for, you know, the Spectra 70 and some of the other technology they were working with at the time. Uh, and even beyond that, like uh, after RCA was bought out by GE and uh, split up a bit, uh, the Sar David Sarnoff Research Center, which is what the Sarnoff Labs became, uh, they were working on a virtual reality game system in the 90s. Uh, and you folks have basically all the documentation from the people who led that project in your stacks. So that was extremely interesting to come across. <laughs> really? I mean, I know, I know the core of today's interview was supposed to be oral history, but uh, virtual reality... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I believe I interviewed one of the people involved on that. Let me just double check. Yep, yep. Uh, Charlie Wine. Uh, he was one of the two people involved on that. And when I spoke to him, we talked uh, a fair bit about that, as well as the, his work on some of those computer games from the 60s. So a whole career in sort of this gaming adjacent thing that RCA tried to get started but never really they never fully cracked the code am i right in that understanding yeah they gave it a shot but they never really went into it all that uh heavily um i, I actually found uh an interview that uh rca's president uh i think it was edgar griffin at the time i'd have to double check um uh, but uh, when their Studio 2 game system went out on the market, uh, he was talking about it. <clears throat> and then in the next sentence, he's like, well, we're kind of expecting it to be a fad. So we're not putting that many resources into it anyway. We think uh, videotapes and uh, video disc are much bigger deals, uh, which, you know, he wasn't wrong, but also it wasn't, a, they weren't that big a deal for RCA. So uh was not as successful for them as he was hoping. Right. So let's get into some of the oral history of this. Maybe uh, if you could talk a little bit about method, what was it like for to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me re, uh, restart my question. How did you find and identify potential interviewees? 
Uh, so this actually predates uh, me getting the grant, actually. Uh, so I remember I first started thinking of interviewing some of these people some years ago when I first realized Hagley had all of these documents and I kept seeing the same names on a lot of them. So I started trying to track a few of them down. Um, fortunately, uh, someone else I knew in the area had already reached out to a couple folks and was able to get me started. So uh, he he already tracked down, I think, Andy Modla, who was one of the game developers for the Studio 2 and the VIP, and Joyce Weisbecker, who's Joe Weisbecker's daughter, and uh, also did some games on contract work for RCA. Uh, so I was able to interview them, and they suggested a few other folks, and it sort of snowballed from there. And then I also found names in your files, and I started... You know, basically looking at the white pages and uh, writing some physical letters out and seeing what uh, what came back. Uh, and I also got another boost. Um, uh, Florencia Pieri, who used to work up at the College of New Jersey in their Sarnoff collection. Uh, she every so often would put out a little newsletter for RCA alumni. And uh, she mentioned that I was hoping to talk to people who worked on their computers and games. And I got a couple bites from that as well. Uh, so that sort of got me started, and indeed part of the oral history was just, uh, you know, getting these folks to sign off on having the interviews I'd done with them uh, be donated to uh, the Hagley Museum, or convincing others that I'd already talked about, or that I had talked with, uh, you know, by email to actually sit down and do an oral interview with me. Right. I say, and it's some great material. But, um... What was sort of the reaction like? Because uh, I know sometimes uh, when someone's involved in a thing, they don't necessarily think about the historical consequences, what they're working on may or may not have down the road. So what was the reaction like when you reach out to these people saying, hey, I not only do I want to learn about RCA, I want to learn specifically about your time with video games and RCA. <laughs> Uh, so the reaction was all over the place. Uh, a few folks were really enthusiastic that, you know, someone had taken an interest in some of the work they'd done. Uh, one person was like, wow, I haven't thought about any of that in a long time. Uh, see what I actually remember about any of it. Uh, and then um, and there was one person who uh, was just, uh, I don't know how to put it. He, he wasn't uh, prickly about it, but he was just like, I, I don't know why you are interested in this topic, but sure, we'll talk about uh, you know, the 1802 and my work on it, and that sort of thing. So it really ran the gamut. Um, once, I, once I actually got the grant, uh, I think that helped a little bit because then I could point to hey, this is, a, this is a professional effort. It's not just me doing this for you know, my own projects. Uh, and that generally got people a lot more interested in uh, sitting down for an oral interview, even if they had been hesitant before, because uh, I think they saw this as an opportunity to, you know, tell their story and talk about their career at RCA. Well, there you have it. We opened doors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, more importantly, what, what were some of your... Uh, Hmm. What were some of the biggest questions that you asked everybody? And were the stories that you learned kind of, you know, sometimes uh, documenting one company's history, you sort of can start to get a sense of there being almost a uniform storyline. Was that the case for this or not so much? Uh, yeah, uh, in a lot of cases, since a lot of their careers sort of intertwined with each other, uh, the you'd have something that someone would mention and I would just sit there and think, what are they talking about? And then I'd listen to another one of the interviews and uh, go over the transcript and think, oh, that's what they were talking about. Uh, these are intertwined stories. Uh, so I was able to, you know, sort of piece these things together as I was talking to folks um, like, uh, you know, uh, and or Tony Roby, I guess, uh, is what he usually goes by. Uh, he worked on the early Fred computer project on with 
under Joe Weisbecker and he worked under Bob Winder, uh, who I also interviewed for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and he told a lot of the same uh, stories from a different angle from what I'd heard from another person, uh, Paul Russo, uh, a couple of years prior uh, during my independent interview phase. Uh, so it was very interesting. I think between those and the documents, I have a very uh, fleshed out picture of, at the very least, that period of time. Uh, and uh, plus, I got some really fun anecdotes out of uh, some of these interviews. Uh, when I talked to Joyce Weisbecker, she talked about uh, how her dad, you know, how he got started at RCA and um, his work with the, the Bismack computer in the 50s. He was one of the techs working on that thing. And uh, she relayed a story he had told her about how when they had a, a Navy uh, crew coming through to try and sell them a Bismack, uh someone on the programming team he didn't know who and she didn't know who had set up the machine to play anchors away because uh, <laughs> you know it was a noisy mechanical contraption and as it was doing its processing it would make all these different sounds and someone realized it and figured out the exact sequence of uh programming code to make each of those sounds play in the specific order for the song they didn't end up buying a bismack but i guess the guy came back uh like the next week with an admiral just to have him see the the song play in action, which I thought was really interesting. And uh, I sort of have worked that into the you know book I'm working on with all of this information, uh, sort of an early anecdote of computer whimsy at uh, RCA. Right. And when did they decide uh, to specifically turn their energy toward entertainment? Uh, on uh, purpose so uh, officially that would have been in the mid 70s i believe uh, when the 1802 microprocessor was just about finalized um, i know joe weisbecker his push for his fred prototype computer that he made at home was that he figured well okay we do this as a way to introduce people to computers and make them seem friendly and interesting and therefore it should play games uh you know, that was part of his pitch to RCA, but the bigger part of his pitch is that they could have their own microprocessor and use that in all sorts of devices, which is what the company did. Uh, but, you know, that was part of his old thing. It was part of the effort that they went through when they were developing it. Uh, there were, you know, like I said, a couple games in the 60s. <clears throat> uh, they were shown at the uh, open house at the David Sarnoff Research Center for its anniversary. Um, I think it was the 20th anniversary and I'd have to double check my notes. Um, but they had a pool game that uh, Larry French and a couple other folks put together on the Spectra 70 computer uh, and a maze game that was put together by Charlie Wine and that used uh, like a storage monitor uh, that sort of, it saves the image as you, you know, work your way through it. So uh those were their two big quote unquote game things that they had there uh they both told me all about how they technically worked which was great because i couldn't find a lot of notes on them specifically at the hagley papers it looks like they had been pulled out of the rca archives for a court case in the 80s and just never got returned so who knows where they are now uh, but at the very least, we know how they worked, and we actually, I actually found a photo of the pool game in action in the archive, which was very cool. But uh, that is cool. And but as uh, Larry French <laughs> was amusing when I was interviewing him, he just he just stopped for a minute and thought, you know, they never tried to make money off of that, which is surprising to me and kind of annoying because it was a pretty good game. They could have done something with it other than just have us demonstrate it to people who visited the labs. That's actually tied into the next question I wanted to ask you, which is who did they see these games as being for? So these were totally just for demonstrative purposes at that time. Yeah, the ones in the 60s, that was what they were used for. They were used for the open house. And then after that, uh, when people came to visit the labs, like you know, government officials or other you know business uh, type folks 
uh, they would bring, they would cart them out to uh, you know show off sort of the power of their technology uh, and what you could do with it in, in a way that was pretty easy to understand for someone who wasn't deep in the in the computer minds, if you will. Because the like the pool game, it's it's cool if you know how to play pool. It was a pretty good rendition of it for 1967. You used a like a light pen to hit the ball or hit the pu the cue ball and knock all the you know pool balls around. And uh, there's actually a video of it because uh, they had a couple like news crews out, and you can find video of the pool game in action. It's actually kind of interesting to see in motion yeah, with a light but, pen is that almost like some sort of proto nintendo wii type setup or? <laughs> um it's like uh you see it a lot with artists but yeah it was a it was like a little pen that worked with the display they had for the spectra 70 uh, and you'd you know touch it to the screen and then it would you know measure the you know, speed you were moving it and it would infer the power for the uh, pool cue at that point and the cue ball uh it was actually funny because i asked to to describe the game and how it worked and he was talking about how the cue ball would hit the other balls and it would just stop uh for a couple of minutes and he couldn't figure out what was going on and then all of a sudden the game started moving again and then he realized oh all the balls are touching each other so the computer has to run through all of the calculations of how the physics are working on each ball as they're colliding each other at the same time and it just has to sit there and work through all that so his solution was to just separate them all very slightly so that the calculations didn't all have to happen at once and apparently that made it run really well hmm. <laughs> so it was it was a very fun interview and you know of course i i figured well it's an oral history i should ask him about more than just that so we sort of discussed his whole career at rca and what he got up to afterwards and that actually provided me with, you know, additional information for, you know, later interviews because he talked about his time in management and who the other managers were, and therefore I could sort of flesh out the structure of uh, this whole computer game uh, area of the company. Once the computer game era ended. Did a lot of the folks who worked on that wind up in the same place? Uh, so it depends. Some of them uh, went to other companies. Uh, like I know, uh, like I know, Paul Russo left. Uh, I believe uh, Joe Weisbecker retired. <clears throat> um, some of the other folks were already managers, and they just managed other projects. A few folks uh, went on to work on video disc uh, CED uh, stuff. Uh, and there's one interview I did prior to the oral history. I'm still trying to get uh, the guy to sign off on it uh, so I could have it donated. But he talked at length about, you know, his work on video disc and how that led into developing the MPEG video standard. And I'm like, wow, this is really interesting stuff. I want to make sure it's in my book but i also want other people to be able to see this so uh, i've been going back and forth with him on getting that approved for a while now it's just been difficult because i have a one-year-old and he has grandkids so we both have been distracted quite easily on this that's understandable mm -hmm. um to return back to the demonstration games for a little bit yeah. What was the lifespan of this? You know, for how long was RCA using them as a demonstration of computing power for potential customers? Uh, it sounded like to me uh, that they kept using these until they, you know, just got out of the computer business in 1971, uh, which uh, it wasn't abrupt per se, but it didn't sound like everyone knew it was coming because they were moving people to different parts of the country and the folks were like well if they're moving us up to you know, boston or whatever surely they're not going to fire us all after that and well then they sold it off <laughs> and that was that um, tumultuous yeah. decade 
Uh huh. Uh, it, was, it was a tumultuous time at RCA for sure because they were getting into a conglomeration uh, period after David Sarnoff retired and then passed away. Uh, mm-hmm. So they were buying up all these other companies like Hertz Rent a Car and Cornet Carpets, and uh, uh, there was some chicken company as well. And the reasoning was, well, if there's a downturn in one business, then we'll have other ones to keep us uh, afloat. Uh, but almost everyone I talked to basically had a lot of words to say on why that was a really silly idea and why it really didn't work out because it forced them away from their focus on consumer electronics. Yes, of course, that makes me think, uh, hearing the reference to rugs, chickens, and autos uh, makes me think of the other book that we've had come through uh, that we had the author do an author talk at Hagley on the TVs of tomorrow and RCA's attempts at developing an LCD screen in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what, what might have been and RCA seems to be a recurring theme. Oh, yeah. It's actually really funny because I was reading about uh, in the 80s where they had turned back to that topic and were working on flat screen TV technology. And, uh, you know, then they were sold off to GE and everyone was really mad about it because, hey, we were profitable again. We could have at least held out for more money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know in addition to speaking with the people who developed these games and the technology that powered them, you've also been involved in emulating some of these games to run on modern systems. Uh, can you say anything about that? Yeah, so this was interesting. Um, so both Hagley and the College of New Jersey have a collection of cassette tapes from the RCA archive. Uh, I think between the two, there's like 130 something. Uh, and some years ago, uh, myself and a couple other folks were really interested in getting these digitized and uh, see if we could you know, read the data that was on them in any sort of meaningful way. Uh, Andy Modla, who I've talked about previously, he was really helpful because he remembered a lot of the technology and where to find the specific information on this stuff in the uh, Hagley archives. Um, there was a couple other folks, uh, uh, Herb Johnson, he's a big, uh, uh, Cosmac 1802 enthusiast, so he knew a lot of this information. Uh, he's a fellow out in, uh, uh, I think it's Sweden, uh, one of the Nordic countries. He was involved because uh, he wrote an emulator for 1802 based systems already. And, you know, here's a bunch of stuff that's right up his wheelhouse. So he really wanted to try and get it working. Um, Flori Pieri up in TCNJ, she was very involved uh, with their tapes as well. Uh, and the end result is that we were able to get almost all of the tapes uh, successfully read. Uh, a lot of them had like duplicate programs on them, but uh, uh, in total, there's a few dozen games for the Fred prototype. Uh, five of the arcade games uh, were on those files, plus a bunch of uh, VIP and Studio 2 games, including a couple of uh, prototype ones that didn't come out. Uh, and others that were really just little test demo programs. Uh, so one thing that was actually very helpful was uh, last year I was able to go up to New Jersey and Pennsylvania and do some in-person interviews for this oral history project with some of the uh, uh, people who worked on these games. And I was able to record snippets of these uh, games in action and use them as visual aids. Uh, so. You know, like I spoke to Tony Roby and I, I brought up the little blackjack game he wrote for Fred and the, the spot speedway game. And he got really excited and talked about uh, how he put those together and actually called his son over. It's like, hey, you remember these? <laughs> uh, I, I seem to recall bringing this stuff home for you to check out. And he's like, ah, oh, kind of. So that, that was that was good. It was a nice little extra dimension I was able to add to uh, all of that. I know the Hagley programs, they, they are, you know, on the website. Uh, TCNJ, I think you have to email them for access, uh, just based on how their uh, legal advisors just wanted to handle that. 
but they're there. If right. you want to load them up in an interview, you can check in an interview in an emulator, you can check them out. So what was that like to encounter people with work that they'd done almost, well, I guess in the case of some of the arcade games, uh, over 50 years ago? Uh, it was really interesting uh, just to bring these things up that they hadn't seen in you know decades and probably did not expect to see again. Um, like you, you see them just light up, just really excited to see this stuff. Uh, running again and uh there were there was definitely some interest uh, uh that you know people could actually try out these things that they had you know worked on and were just messing around with some of their uh co-workers with so for what made it to market or i i guess i should back that up and say not everything made it to market uh but amongst things that did make it to market what was their level of success the sort of footprint that they left behind um and did they sell a lot of copies what did a lot of copies look like back then <laughs> uh so uh the t at the time they were really involved in the video game market it was about 77 78 um the cosmic vip came out in 77 and that lasted a few years as like a hobbyist kit computer and then at the same time, you had a uh, Studio 2 as a home game system that came out in February 77. Uh, they, did, they did not do as well as I think they'd hoped. Uh, they did not do as well as the, their competitors in the same sort of programmable game system space. So like when I say programmable, I mean, uh, you know, the developers there could program a game for a specific, uh, you know, a microprocessor and you could plug that in and run it uh, as opposed to have to buy a whole new system that could only run one game because that's what's built into it. So you had like the dedicated market that was very, uh, at that point in time, that was sort of the low end and relegated mostly to toys and that sort of thing. And then at the programmable level, you had, uh, you know, Atari had a system, Fairchild had a system, and RCA had a system. And uh, Atari and Fairchild sold around 200,000, 300,000 uh, units of these in 77. Uh, according to an internal memo, RCA sold around 53 and 64,000 uh, of their production run, which was far below ev everything else was. Um, There's some speculation both internally from RCA and uh, from uh, some of the press at the time, the industry press, that uh, they, they they just didn't price it very competitively compared to those. Uh, like it was slightly cheaper than Fairchild's machine, but you know Fairchild's machine was in color, RCA's was not. Uh, Fairchild's machine had you know distinct controllers that were a little weird, but worked pretty well. RCA's system had keypads built into it. Uh, because you know it came out of a weird little computer machine uh, called the Fred, so it 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 just did not do very well. And yeah, it, they had a price drop for it in I believe December of '77, which was considered way too late to sort of turn things around for them. Uh, so they ended up uh, canceling that program in February '78. Uh, then they licensed the technology out to a company out of Hong Kong called Conic, uh, and they sold clones of the Studio 2 successor, the Studio 3, in Europe and Asia and Australia, uh, and they even released a few of the games that were developed for the Studio 3 but did not get released in the U.S. because RCA had dropped out of the market. Uh, so they kept that going for a little while longer. I haven't found firm numbers on that just because it's hard for me to search you know newspapers from other countries but uh from all indications that went for another year or so and this the vip um <clears throat> i don't think it was ever a huge hit but it was enough of a success that they you know they they produced a second uh, manual of games um which uh, you folks had a copy of and actually got scanned online, which was quite handy. 
because uh, I know at least some of the interviews I did, uh, those games came up and I was able to sort of discuss them. Um, and yeah, uh, they were planning a follow-up system in 1980, the VIP2, which was functionally just the VIP with some of the optional expansions built right into it. Uh, and then that got canceled a few months before it was supposed to come out. Um, I actually found uh, the schematics for the VIP2 in the Hegley archives and that emulator author added that to his emulator. So even though there's not really any distinct software for it, it's right there. You can try it out, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. Uh, and then, yeah, it was canceled. Uh, RCA was working on a separate uh, uh, personal computer uh, project that also ended up canceled in favor of video disc. Uh, no one I've talked to about the VIP can really speak uh, to its cancellation uh, directly, but it sounds like it, you know, based on everything else, uh, the company was really focused in on video disc and that's where they wanted to put their resources. And this was just a, a minor enough part of their business that they didn't feel like uh, they were going to lose much by getting rid of it. That's my takeaway at this time. I might have some more interviews down the line that will help uh, describe that a little better. And just, I know I don't know very much about this myself. Video disc is different to laser disc. Yes. yes. So laser disc, you know, it uses laser. Uh, this is uh, more akin to a record player. So there's like a capacitance needle that uh, runs along the disc itself. Doesn't actually touch the disc, but it uh, it is able to read uh, the information in the grooves and turn that into uh, a video and audio picture. And uh, there are actually a few video disc games that were made uh, before they RCA dropped the format. Uh, they're sort of like laser disc games where they're playing through a certain thing, and then uh, you make a choice, and then it bounces around. Uh, you needed a special player to run those that had a sort of a random uh, access mode. But uh, there were a few of those, and some of the folks I talked to for this project uh, did end up going to work on those uh, uh, before you know RCA closed up and dropped the video disc entirely because it was never the success that they wanted it to be. You know, it was like 15 years in the making, and by the time it came out, uh, you know, VHS tapes had sort of stolen its thunder. So what are some of the big picture takeaways that you got from conducting these oral histories? Uh, so my biggest takeaway is that, uh, you know, RCA at the time just didn't really know what they wanted to do. I mean, they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to be a conglomerate, but uh, that meant that all of these different sections of the company were not getting the kind of resources that they really wanted, or in some of these cases, the managerial uh, you know, approval and backing that they needed. Like the, the Studio 2, it didn't sell many copies, uh, but uh, one of the issues that kept getting flagged for me is that uh, it was not sold through their consumer products division, which had you know, the money and the marketing muscle and uh, the connections to all these stores. It was sold by their special products division, which sold antennas and those kinds of accessories for TVs. So they had a much smaller budget, very little marketing money, uh, very few retail connections. So I think one of the big problems that the Studio 2 had was that it just didn't have that level of uh, you know, accessibility. Um, and you know, that, that's sort of true beyond that. Like the VIP, it was sold as a kit uh, you know, through mail order. There weren't I don't know if it was available in dedicated computer stores, which would be the other option, but as a kit computer, uh, it would have been relegated specifically to hobbyists. And as far as I know, hobbyists liked it, but they seemed, uh, it, it came out at the same time that you were starting to get the first uh, pre-built computers like the Apple II had first come out and the TRS-80 and the Commodore PT. Uh, so those, you know, you got a computer and it was, 
built already. Uh, in the case of the Apple II, you could still do modifications and uh, hobbyist stuff to it. So uh, that was always an option and it was going to be a more capable machine regardless. Um, so I think in that case, part of it was timing and part of it was just how it was being placed. Uh, <laughs> the arcade machines uh, seem to be a little bit messier. Uh, you know, they location tested these at a couple arcades in 75. And when they went to check them again later, uh, the arcade operators had them unplugged and weren't using them. Um, there was an old oral history done in 2003 with Billy Joe Call, who is one of the techs working at the, on that project. He passed away, I think, the following year. Uh, but his recollection uh, was that they kind of wondered if uh, you know organized crime was involved on that because uh, you know if, if these were test machines, they weren't getting a cut of the money from them. So maybe they you know, didn't want to piss off you know any uh, criminal groups that the arcade operators were having to deal with. But don't know for sure. All we know for sure is that. Uh, they didn't make a lot of money, so those weren't pursued either. And then some of the other thoughts that they had, like uh, they had ideas for educational machines with uh, random house and school systems, those sort of fell to the wayside once they realized that a lot of the schools that they were looking at uh, did not have a lot of <laughs> power outlets in their classrooms. So, uh, one of the interviews I did they were, was with someone who worked on that sort of educational uh, approach. And he explained taking their Fred machine out to school system nearby uh, to see how the kids liked it. And they got to the classroom and realized that after they plugged in the TV and, uh, uh, and everything, they did not have enough outlets to also plug in the Fred. So, uh, that just hit uh, the realities of, you know, 1970s school buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, the days before the dedicated computer lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were lucky, you had terminals somewhere so you could access, you know, like the computers at Dartmouth or whatever. But uh, you know, this was an attempt to get around that and it, it was a noble attempt, but it, it just didn't, didn't time it right. Right. And what is your uh, future goal for these oral histories? Is, do, you th uh, do you think there's more interviewing to be done? Uh, there is a bit. There's a couple people I've been trying to schedule interviews with. Um, you know, they're still working, so it's been very tricky. Uh, I'm actually going to be down in the area where one of them lives uh, next spring. So if I can't get anything before then, I'll just see if I can go to his house and uh, <laughs> talk to him in person. And get that recorded uh and i believe another one lives nearby as well uh if i can catch him as well um and i do want to try and get sign off from uh you know the one person with that interview i done previously i think we can probably hammer that out as long as uh i can remember to keep at him uh, as he requested me to and then i you know probably forgot for four months because I had a newborn. <laughs> uh, and um, there's still a couple more folks I'm hoping I can track down. Uh, I'm at a point now where the folks have either passed away or they're like ghosts in the wind and they're really hard to come across. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I do, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll want to talk. Like I talked to someone who was happy to do, you know, email correspondence, but he didn't want to sit down for oral history. Uh, someone else. Uh, uh, he had medical issues and wasn't able to uh, sit with an oral history interview. Uh, another person who worked on the, the marketing for the studio too, who I really wanted to talk to, never heard back. So uh, still trying, uh, still interested in getting as many of these as I can, but uh, sir, I think I'm hitting uh, the edge on what's left out there. All right. Well, I'm not sure I can dream up any more questions related to oral history. Um, <laughs> was there anything I didn't ask you today that you were prepared to talk about that you thought we would hit on, but we might not have? 
Um, so I am hoping to put all all this together into a history of RCA's games and computers book. Uh, as I mentioned it earlier today, a little bit, uh, a certain number of chapters into it, I had to put it aside to work on uh, the Atari archive book because you know, I got a contract for that. I figured, well, I should probably finish this before my deadline comes up. But now uh, that that's done, I'm back to the RCA book. And hopefully once I've got a publisher and everything, I can uh, get that out and more folks can learn about what made this uh, company kind of interesting in this space that even though they weren't very successful, they did a lot of cool stuff. Great. And since you do have a book coming up in March, uh, can you say a little bit about that before we sign off? Sure. So this is a book. Uh, it covers 1977 and 1978. Uh, it's focused primarily on the Atari 2600 VCS, uh, whatever you want to call it, and its, uh, its creation and development and the contextualization of those, uh, like the technology underlying it, uh, as well as the games that came out in that two-year period for it. Uh, so talking about, you know, combat for the Atari, how it uh, was created, why it was created, why it was packed in with the system, all that fun stuff. Uh, and, you know, RCA factors into this as well, because I figured, well, if I'm going to contextualize what this all looked like, I should also talk about the competing platforms and their histories and, you know, what they did well and what they did poorly. Uh, so if you're interested more about RCA, it's, it's right in there too, uh, as well as information on Fairchild and all these other companies. Uh, I think their hope at the publisher is to do a few of these books, uh, you know, covering the different years of the Atari's lifespan. But uh, at this point, we've just got the first one, we'll see how it's doing, uh, and then go from there. And that's due out in March of 23? Yes, uh, and it's going out through Press Run Books, which is uh, the print imprint for the company Limited Run Games. Uh, as far as I know, it is not a limited run print uh, printing. <laughs> They're just going to keep it in print as long as people are interested in purchasing it. Oh, that's great. And eventually, uh, once you've completed your own book, the interviews that you've done for the RCA project will live online in Hagley's archive at uh, hagley.org slash oral history. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that too, because there's a lot of really good information in there. And even if it wasn't necessarily stuff I needed for my project, I think someone will be interested in it. You know, they worked on a lot of cool stuff over there, even beyond their games. Right. And we certainly appreciate it. And uh, thank you for sitting with us today and telling us all about your project and your work on these oral histories. And for our audience out there, if you'd like more Hagley History Hangouts or more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, uh, join us online. Uh, you can find us at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot org. And don't be a stranger. And that goes for our audience, uh, just as much as you, Mr. Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always yeah. happy to show up. And thank you again. All right. Till okay. next time. All right.